Okay, so <clears throat> as you heard earlier from Andrew and from Sylvie, PLUS is uh, building a registry. Um, it's unusual for one organization to uh, develop both standards and a service. This organization was specially purposed to do both of those things to solve a marketplace issue. And so we first set about um, methodically building the standards that you saw earlier, as well as other ones I didn't have time to present, and then immediately proceeded into building the registry. This organization is governed by, uh, it's an unusual governance. It's got one seat for each industry sector. So one seat for the publishers of the world, one seat for the creators of the world, et cetera. And those seats can only be held by a nonprofit organization who assigns a delegate to the board. So it's been made impervious to buyouts or takeovers, and no one industry sector can um, apply um, an inappropriate level of influence because they would be stopped by the others. This is very important around rights metadata. You know, descriptive and technical metadata, it's not so much of an issue, but rights data, metadata, it is. So the industries involved in PLUS felt that there needed to be at least um, one um, nonprofit resource that was independent of, of commercial influence, let's say, or undue influence from any one sector, so that this uh, registry system could exist to hold um, rights metadata. It's actually more of a registry hub that connects multiple registries. It's an information service, so you can query it use a, using an identifier to get rights information out. You can query it using image recognition to get rights information out. You can get information about parties. Uh, we're also going to be working with ISNI on party identifiers, but we have our own party identifiers and we'll also federate identifiers that are issued by other authorities. We also have IDs for um, images or assets and IDs for license transactions. And of course, we can also provide uh, rights information in a standardized form. The registry is actually up. That's a screenshot of it. Um, we're, we're beta testing it. We wanted to get about 10,000 people into the registry. We've got about 12,000 people from 94 countries at this point uh, just testing it. We're going to ramp that up to about 25,000 over the next month, and then we'll start taking in images um, slowly at first, um, low quantities of images, and then ramp that up um, dramatically with images from uh, picture libraries and, and people with more substantial archives. So it is designed to operate as a hub. Um, as I mentioned, it's got an, an ID federation la layer, so you can come at it with any type of ID, and provided that that's registered and associated with a PLUS ID, we'll connect you with the appropriate record, either in our registry or in other connected registries. Um, there are um, to be sub-registries to PLUS that can be operated by sub-registrars who are issued their own identifier prefixes, also external registries that just um, satisfy our API requirements so that um, they can also connect. A uh, search of us can search them, and a search of them can search us. Uh, primarily, uh, you use this registry to find rights holders, um, creators, owners, picture libraries, uh, museums, libraries, and uh, other, uh, uh, other authorized licensors, as well as to find metadata. And we started out only intending to provide uh, rights metadata, but in the end, the, all the parties involved have uh, insisted that they wish to have their, meta, um, their metadata um, discoverable through the PLUS registry, so we're also incorporating a wide variety of metadata schemas, some of which can't be embedded into images or not compatible with XMP or other means of embedding into images, so we'll be, um, Ray will talk a little bit about that in a moment. So our IDs identify parties, assets, licenses, and documents that are associated with rights, and we employ the CNRI handle system, very similar to uh, the DOI system but on a more economical scale. Well, we face an unusual circumstance if we've got, um, let's say, photographers or independent creators who um, don't have very high income but produce huge quantities of assets. And while a, a, a DOI or a, a, might work for a publisher or a university, um, the, the cost associated with DOIs would be unaffordable for independent artists. So we've, we're, uh, we've got our own CNRI prefix and we'll be uh, issuing handle-based identifiers, but we also, again, support external identifiers. So to find information, you search, you can find the party who registered the record that's associated with, a, with an ID, or if the ID has been lost, you can search by the image itself and it'll, it knows who you are, the searcher, so it'll report back any um, records that are connected to you, whether you're a licensee or an end user or a licensor or an owner or a creator or some combination of the above. 
it doesn't rely entirely on image recognition because, uh, for example, with image recognition, if I were to take two quick pictures here uh, with a motor drive, it, both of them would be exactly the same visually, but two separate copyrighted works. And also with um, image recognition, if there's very small differences between images that are too granular for the um, image recognition fingerprinting to see, then you end up with both of those images being treated as the same. Uh, it's a fantastic technology, but we are using it in, in order uh, to, I, to connect images back to metadata if the identifier is lost. And our image recognition technology is provided by uh, PicScout. You can also, using that image recognition search, you can find all the parties that have registered an image that matches the image that you're searching by. You can optionally register license transactions. Now, no transactions pass through us. We're just an information service. And it was felt that the nonprofit should control this connection between the, the rights holder or other party and the image and the rights metadata so that um, it can't, this, this um, uh, organization can't be purchased. It can't be taken over. Um, it's, uh, so you can't have a, a stakeholder or a big search engine, let's say, come in and buy it if it's successful. It's forever independent. Um, so if you want to register a license record, um, you can either directly through the registry or through some connected application um, submit information. Uh, we will issue you a license identifier that refers to uh, information that's either stored in the registry or can be stored externally. And any party to a license can access that information. Very often, license information is private information. That's one of the issues with embedded rights information is everybody can see it. So uh, in many instances, um, people don't embed metadata because they want to keep uh, that information private. This solves that issue by providing, providing permissions-based access to um, rights information. And also, at any time, you can go in and supplement a license so that you've got dynamic rights information. That ID remains the same that's associated with that file. And a very good example, in closing, is a textbook uh, workflow where a textbook company puts out a call for images for a textbook. They receive 20 or 30,000 images. They need 10,000 images for this textbook. Um, when they receive the images, they're receiving high-res files. Uh, if you put a rights metadata in the file, what are you going to describe? Because the license hasn't been issued yet. It could be for the cover of the book. It could be for the inside of the book. It could be a certain size. You don't know at the time that the image is delivered. So there's a problem where, where the right, rights metadata would get out of sync or is unknown at the time that the image is delivered. You don't have another opportunity after that to deliver another image just for the sake of getting the metadata to the, to, the, to the textbook publisher. So you put an ID in the file, the image is delivered, that ID is ingested by the DAM system at the publisher. If they look that up then, it says for review only because that's what the vendor put in. And then later, a few months down the road, when the, when the publisher selects which images are going to go where, they license those rights, you update the rights in the registry, and now when their DAM system uh, looks up that ID, they see the rights for the image as licensed. And in a year, when you license additional rights, like another edition or greater quantity, the license can be updated again, and you see a supplementary license when you search by that identifier. It's a practice that is consistent with actual practice out in the industry, similar to how PLUS operates in all respects. We are not going to offer keyword searches for images. You don't come to the PLUS registry to look for images that you don't have. You're either searching by an ID or by, uh, for an image or by the image that you already have. So there's no subject matter searches, like you can't search for images of a giraffe, no browsing of images, no licensed transactions passing through the registry, no public access to private information, and nothing to do with price. We're completely agnostic on price. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ray. Hello. I'm trying to keep my side short here. Uh, Ray Gauss, co-founder and CTO of RightsPro, which is a site that helps buyers and sellers define and negotiate licenses for the use of content using various rights expression languages, including ODRL, PLUS, Creative Commons, uh, and take that license all the way through its transaction so that it's fully enacted. I'm also Digital Asset Management Architect at Alfresco, which is an open source enterprise content management platform. Obviously, architecting the PLUS registry and I'm also on Apache Tika project, which is an open source Java lower level kind of framework um, that is that deals with embedding and extracting meta various metadata from a wide variety of 
of uh, file types. Um, and it does that by drawing upon other open source projects um, as well as it, its own code. So I'm very excited to find an entire room of people that are just as excited about metadata and licensing as I am. So thank you, IPTC. Uh, as we talked about, metadata is a very important part of any registry of this type. Um, the permissions uh, that Jeff talked about briefly are, are incredibly important for something like this. Um, another example that I'm not sure has been mentioned is something like a car manufacturer that's passing around or negotiating rights for, uh, let's say, a model of car that may be coming out or any sort of product. You can imagine that they're, um, or let's say, a uh, highly secretive specialized flower uh, that we heard about this morning. So those types of things you may not want to be returned in public searches, even if somebody does somehow have access to, let's say, that identifier. Uh, but of course, the authorized parties involved in that licensing transaction have access to view appropriate levels of metadata that they need. And there's lots of different metadata types um, that the PLUS registry will support, uh, including course, IPDC, um, PLUS, Dublin Core, VRA, AdID, uh, there are a few others in there. And again, to that point, the metadata is remote and dynamic. And while that's incredibly important for rights metadata that we've heard about today, um, it also relates to the informational metadata. Um, and sometimes I think we forget that that um, if I put in a keyword of flower, that's certainly not descriptive enough for some people. And as time goes on and I encounter other people and I understand more about exactly what flower type that is and its genus and species and everything else, I can start to fill out additional metadata. And that we've encountered that many, many times uh, in, in various use cases where that informational metadata needs to be expanded or corrected. So having it even that in a dynamic stage is incredibly helpful. And of course, it's secure. If there's something that uh, needs to be redacted from, from some metadata, that's instantly done. So how do users get at this metadata? Obviously, they can go to the website and uh, standard web interface and um, manage their metadata that way. Uh, but that's not going to be practical for the large majority of cases out there. So we need to have applications, other registries, a number of means to be able to get at that. And that obviously will lead us directly to an API implementation there, where we can have licensing platforms that are responsible for uh, completing that licensing transaction, be able to access the registry to, again, define assets, parties involved, the rights that are being transacted. Digital asset management systems for both the rights holders of content and the consumers of content. The rights holders need to register large quantities of images and they need their digital asset management system to push that directly to the registry over an API. And of course, as we've heard, the publishing organizations and any consumers of content um, are often under extremely tight deadlines and need very quickly to determine what are the current rights that we have for this. And we don't want to pass around multiple copies of the image and marketing has one that has some rights embedded in it and another organization has that and then decides that oh, print does not is, is not in these rights that we have here, the organization needs to be able to go and dynamically determine immediately from within their digital asset management system, not hop out of their entire workflow, what exactly those current rights are for their organization and the use that they need to, uh, to use that image for at, at that time. <laughs> Desktop applications are going to come in handy for, of course, the creators themselves. You've got something like Lightroom plugins, Aperture plugins, uh, basic desktop applications that are going to facilitate the um, quicker registration and embedding of these persisted IDs in the images. Devices, uh, there's no reason that iPhones or a, uh, an iFi card in a DSLR could not do the same task and access that same API. And then, of course, other registries that are involved in this entire hub. And that's it.